the Joe Rogan experience. So when you guys, like in the early days of the band, mm. what was, uh, like, that's always the connection with rock and roll and drugs. Like, this is like, the, that's the narrative. Yeah. Was that, in the early days of Pink Floyd, was that the case? It wasn't really. No? relevant i mean during the, uh, the the time when i was smoking hash every day was 1970 71 70 so it's pre pre dark side it's when we were making metal so it's echoes and things but i don't i don't think it had i don't think it impinged on my burgeoning writing career if you like when i was you know starting to write songs because sid um went crazy in 19 19- 67 and so by 69 he wasn't we weren't seeing him anymore he disappeared completely and was that because of lsd or was it no i don't think so but you know that's the narrative right yeah that's the narrative or one of the narratives um it, it may be because he he was mixing with people who were doing acid on a regular basis i think in 67 um and and um, I'm sure he did too much. He did too much of it. Was he teetering on the edge of what might be called schizophrenia at the time? I think so. Probably. Mm. A lot of the things that he was saying, and it was right at the beginning of us getting our first record in any chart, which was Arnold Lane. No, it was after Arnold Lane. It was in when C. Emily Play came out, and we were beginning to do TV shows in England. And I, and I, he went very odd, and he started. I remember him at Top of the Pops in the dressing room one day. Um, he had hair a bit like that painting on the wall, and uh, going sort of like, and then going, looking worried and a bit frightened, and then going. John Lennon doesn't have to do this, you know, which was kind of wacky. Um, this was like three quarters of the way through the Beatles' career because they'd only had that one decade, really. Um, and so he 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 had misgivings about being on a miming pop show, you know. And do, I mean, Sid, this is what we've worked towards for the last four or five years: is to be on top of the pops and make a few quid, you know. Buck up, boy. Let's get on with it. And uh, but. He never did buck up from from sort of that moment on, really. He wrote a few more songs, but n- nothing of any any real note. And he just got more and more and more detached until he was completely wacky and not making any sense. And we made, I mean, I made a lot of um, attempts to find out what was wrong and to involve his family. You know, he had elder brothers who I would ring up and say, hey, there's something really wrong with... Roger, as they called him, because he wasn't. His name was Roger Barrett, not Sid Barrett. Oh. I said he's not well. I think, and one of the brothers actually came to London and went and saw him and called me up and went, "He's fine, you know. He's had some troubling times, but he's actually fine." And I went, "Alan, he's not. He's not. But trust me, I've been. I live with him, you know." Anyway, and we tried to get him to a shrink. Um, so could, on a number of occasions, but he would never go in, and but, and then he just got weirder and weirder. Like and in weirder. what way weird? Like what was, what was incommunicative? Not making any sense at all. Not making any. It's like I actually mentioned one of the one of the periods, one of the moments is in the show because it's just, it's in when we play "Wish You Were Here," and I do wish he was here. And I, I mean, he's, he's partly what that song's about. And Shine On You Crazy Diamond is just completely about Sid. But we were, I tell the story in text in the show and it goes, um, we'd been to a meeting at the Capitol Tower in, in Los Angeles and Sid and I were walking down the street after it. And we stopped at the traffic light at Hollywood and Vine, Hollywood Boulevard and Vine Street in Los Angeles. And he looked at me and smiled and he said, it's nice here in Las Vegas, isn't it? Well, we were in L.A. So the, he, he, he already had no idea where he was even like that. But then he, I, I say in the thing, you'll see it, the show, it says, then his face darkened and he looked down at the ground and spat out one word, people. 
And it that sort of encapsulates what it was like. Nothing made any sense. Mm. Disjointed. Blank, disjointed, you know. And there we were, all young, all very young, and trying to make our way. And and I, by that time, Dave had already joined the band to play guitar and because Sid could, didn't play. I'm not saying he couldn't. Well, he couldn't really because both of us made solo, his solo records with him, helped produce his solo records after that point. And he was, he, it was pretty kind of disjointed and difficult to get him to do anything. Did he continue to deteriorate further after that? Yeah. And then he went home to live in Cambridge and he lived a very solitary life. And I, I, I spoke to his sister, Rosemary, after that and I said, Could it, does it make any sense, you know, to go and visit? She, no, don't do that. Mm. And she told me, I said, why not? And she said, well, he gets very um, agitated and upset when if he's reminded of what happened before whatever this is. He doesn't like it. He, d he doesn't want to see mm. people from his past. He'd rather be left alone. And he did, and he used to paint a little bit and live just on his own in Cambridge until he died when he was 60. Wow. Um, so I don't know what else to say about it, really. It was tragic, obviously. And but but those of us who were in Pink Floyd at the time experienced it as a existential threat as well. Fuck me, what are we gonna do? He writes the bloody songs. Well I wrote about twenty percent of them before, but well but they were nothing Sid's songs were the things that were different. They had that weird English romanticism about them. You know, they were beautiful. I've got a bike, you can ride it if you like. It's got a basket, a bell that rings and things that make it look good. I'd give it to you if I could, but I borrowed it. That's so quirky mm. in terms of its meter, the way the lyric attaches both to the melody and and to the um, time signature and the tempo of the thing is remarkable. Um and it wasn't just, you know, there were lots of quirky little songs like that, all, very, all in a very English romantic tradition and whatever. So we, how could we possibly survive? If the guy who writes the songs in the band goes crazy, you're fucked, basically. <laughs> Unless somebody else learns to, starts to write. Luckily, I did. I did yeah. start to write. <sighs> <laughs> I'm not, I don't mean to laugh because he was a huge loss. And I did love him. 